bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen. I want to greet you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. You know, the psalm is said in Psalm 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. And how good it is for us to be discussing, amen, the word of God tonight. The Bible says in the book of St. John that we must sanctify them through thy truth because his word is truth. And I strongly believe that tonight, uh, as we continue on a subject that we started, that God will continue to bless us and that the word of God will find its rightful place in our hearts. I pray right now that every hearer of the word tonight, amen, that their hearts will not be stony ground or their hearts will not be all the other grounds, the, the thorny place, praise God, but it will be a good ground that it might find root and bring forth a hundredfold and even much more than that as we are blessed by the word of God. Amen. Tonight, last week, amen, we did the topic of my uh, Christian heritage. And if you look back at in revision what we spoke about last week, we spoke about our apostolic roots. Amen. We spoke about the Pentecostal experience and the early church. And we spoke about the expectation of the church today. Amen. We said that it is a fact last week that God has always had a plan uh, to pass down his ways from one generation to the other. Amen. And this is just revising what we said last week. We said that, amen, that children, amen, should learn uh, godly things from their parents. Amen. We look at the scripture in Deuteronomy, uh, the Shema, which says that the parents must teach it diligently unto their children. And must talk of them when thou sittest in your house, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We talk about Abraham who passed it down from one generation to the other. Amen. We touch the fact that the church, amen, was built, amen, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. And we also touch the fact that, amen, from the first century church, and we know the church started in about AD 33, in the first century, that the passing down, amen, should be done through our teaching, amen, and our teaching, we look at the scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, which says that, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So we see where Paul was instructing Timothy, amen, that the instructions and the things that he has learned from the Lord should be passed down from one generation to the other. We must pass it down in our teaching. But also we say that it must be passed down in our lifestyle. So we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10. But thou hast fully known, and he said, my doctrine. He says, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience, my persecutions, my afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, Iconium, at Lystra. With persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So here it is that Paul is telling Timothy his lifestyle. He was saying that you have seen all these things portrayed in my life. My doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience, and so on and so forth. So from last week we learned that our heritage must be passed down through our teaching and through our lifestyle. Amen. We also learn that the enemy uh, wants to attack our heritage. It's a fact that the enemy wants to attack our, in, our heritage. And we look at the fact that he attacks it through, uh, by attacking the name of Jesus Christ. And we look at the different examples even from the first century, second century, um, different theologies that came up um, that tried to attack the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. But we were encouraged at the end of the day. Amen. That irrespective of where the enemy attacks our heritage, either its name, our baptism, or our lifestyle, or how we walk, or how we talk, as Christians, amen, we were encouraged at the end of the day, amen, that we should fight for it. 
Amen. We were saying that we must fight for our heritage. Amen. We look at the scripture in Jude chapter 1 and verse 3. Amen. Which says that we must practically uh, fight for this thing that we have in our lives. Amen. We were learning that we should guard it. Amen. We must, we do not sell it out at all. Amen. I will look at the scripture in 1 Kings chapter 21. Amen. Where we are encouraged and we are reminded of how Jezebel tried to attack uh, Naboth in terms of getting his vineyard. But at the end of the day, amen, he was not willing to sell. So in a similar way, our heritage, we are not willing to sell out our heritage. We are going to hold fast to that which we had. We were reminded that we should not be intimidated by the enemy. Amen. And we said that the enemy is going to come with different, different things. And we look at the scripture in Nehemiah when he was about to rebuild the wall. And how uh, Sambalat and Tobias came and they, they, they sent their discouraging word to the people. Telling them that, look here. Anything that you do is not going to come to fruition. Uh, they encourage them that look here, the little wall that you're building, if a fox goes on the wall, it's going to turn over. Amen. And he tried to discourage them in doing that. But we are not going to be intimidated by the enemy. We learn that we must keep our minds, keep in our minds that Jesus actually died for it. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 that he purchased Amen. It with his own blood. And we also look at the last thing that we must understand the cost that it takes for us to get it today. We look at the lives of some of the apostles and how they died a cruel death. Amen. In order to ensure that we get this gospel message. So tonight we are going to move on from the heritage. The heritage is the stuff that we need to hold on to. Amen. The thing that we need to be reminded of. The things that we should hold in the back of our minds as we are Christians. And we are going to jump into a topic tonight called our Christian identity. So we are moving now into our Christian identity. Praise God. Now, I want us to understand uh, tonight, brethren, that there is a spiritual war going on over your identity. Um, in the natural world... Amen. We have what is called identity thieves. And what these people actually do is that they will try to get your information. I mean, they will try to get your certain things about you. And they try to steal your identity, as it were. And they will use your identity, amen, to get things out of your bank account. And to get money out of your bank account. They will try to use your identity, amen, to, to, to rob you of, of, of everything that should be rightfully yours. Amen. And uh, in many countries, governments pay billions of dollars, amen, and try to protect, amen, uh, cyber security in relation to the whole issue of identity theft. Uh, we see in a similar way where we have the, what we call the scammers out here. And, and these people will call people um, pretending to be something that they are not. Amen. In order to get certain information from them. In a similar way, we realize that the enemy, amen, who is the orchestrator of all these evils that are taking place in the earth today, uh, is warring and is fighting to get your identity. Uh, he, wants, he wants to ensure that you never... Produce to the world who you should really be. Amen. And the devil has been using every single thing possible to try and to deceive us into believing his lies about who we are. Uh, he wants to, to hold you. Amen. He wants to communicate to you uh, what you should think of yourself or how you should think of yourself. Amen. So the Bible actually says to us in St. John chapter 10 and verse 10, praise God, it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. It says, I am come, however, that he might have life and that he might have it more abundantly. Amen. So we realize that the Bible is saying that the thief has a threefold purpose. It is to steal, and when he, steal, what, what, when he steals your identity, he, what he eventually does is kill you and destroy you. Because if you really don't come into full uh, knowledge of who you are in Christ Jesus, the only other alternative is death. 
Amen. So the devil wants to steal first. He wants to kill and he wants to destroy. The Bible also says in St. John chapter 8 and verse 44 that ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father he will do. He says he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And I highlighted the fact that there is no truth in him. Amen. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus give us some insight from this particular scripture. We know what's taking place. He was talking to the Pharisees, amen, and he was telling them that you are your father, the devil. But he gave us some characteristics of who the devil really is. He is a liar. Lie, practically, is the core of the devil's character. Lying is core of the devil's character. And he is the deceiver and the most dangerous of all. He's a deceiver and that is the most dangerous thing of all. He's a deceiver and he's a manipulator. Amen. So, lie is a score. Amen. And he also deceives and he manip manipulates. And what he's trying to do, brethren, is to rob you of your true identity in Christ. But I want us to understand today that we should never listen to the devil. Never listen to the devil. Even if part of what he is saying sounds like truth, as I said earlier, he is a liar. He, there is no truth really in him. Amen. What he does, amen, he, use, he gives you path truth with the ultimate aim to lead you into a lie. Amen. You should never listen to any part of what the devil is saying. No matter if it sounds like truth. He is a deceiver, brethren, and he's a master manipulator. Can you imagine the fact that this whole world is in the state that it is in because the devil was able to deceive the woman um, and she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and he presented, amen, he presented something to her that sounded good. He said, you shall not surely die, but you shall be as gods knowing good and evil so he presented part truth and part lie because she did surely die amen but that's how the devil is he's a liar he's a deceiver amen he is doesn't speak the truth at all now i want us to look at how the devil preface his attack on the lord jesus christ look at how the devil praise god preface his attack on the lord jesus christ amen what we realize is, brethren, the Bible says in Luke chapter 4 and verse 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Notice, you know, he was using Jesus' identity. And then, so he presents something to him. And then he puts something else that would have been contrary to how God operates. So first of all, he says, if you be the son of God. In other way, the devil will come to you with things. And he will preface it with things that sound like it's truth. But at the end of it, it is to lead you into a lie. The Bible also says in Luke chapter 4 and verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem. And set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, if thou be the son of God. Again, he said the same thing. He knew that Jesus was the son of God. He said, cast thyself down from thence. Amen. But one of the things I like about this is that Jesus was not lured into the trap of the devil. And why this happened? Because he did not have an identity problem. Amen. You see, Jesus knew who he was. And therefore, the devil could not come to him and say, boy, if you are this, and if you are that, do this. Amen. You know, a lot of people are caught into the trap of the enemy. Amen. Because what the devil does, praise God, what the devil will do, he will say to you, that look here, you are supposed to be a preacher. You are supposed to be this and you are supposed to do that. And probably you are a preacher and probably you are a teacher. Amen. But what he'll try to do is to attack your identity. So if you're a teacher, then I'm sure not be holding you down like this. If you're a teacher or a preacher, you should be preaching more often. Or if you're a part of this ministry, you should be doing this and this. But I like how Jesus operates. You see, as I said before, the devil was not able to lure jesus into uh into his trap because jesus did not have 
an identity problem. He knew who he was. You see, the person who has an identity problem will always do a couple things. One, they will always seek approval, amen, or try to prove himself to others. So, in other, so there are different, different times when you have an identity problem and the devil comes to you, amen, what you will try to do is seek the approval of people, amen, but our approval must not be in people, our approval must be in God. The Bible says, what's over your hands, find it to do, do it unto God, not unto man, amen, irrespective of what you're doing, child of God, ensure that at the end of the day, God is getting the glory out of what you do, it's not to prove how well you can sing, it's not to prove how well you can preach or teach amen but our approval should be in god praise god number two amen the person who has an identity problem will always uh try to live um at the reaction they will always react to life circumstances in other words if we are always living our lives in reaction to life circumstances we cannot be led by the spirit and we saw that also because here it is that jesus was in uh, the wilderness the, the ultimate thing for him to do having coming off of 40 days and 40 nights amen of fasting having been in the wilderness having not ate uh, for so many days the rightful thing to do was for him to 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 obey as it were or oblige the devil because it sounded like something that would have been good for him at this time god said turn the stone or the devil said it turn the stone into bread amen but we realize what the, what jesus said jesus at no point in time through scriptures has ever turned stone into bread what we realize how god operates he always turned bread into more bread so what god will do i mean is whatever and this is from a spiritual perspective the more you invest in the word of god amen is the more god will multiply that so the devil was trying to break that principle and he said to jesus if you be the son of god turn these stone into bread Amen. But Jesus used the word of God and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. In other words, he linked back the bread to the word. In other words, if he's going to turn anything into more bread, it would have been the word. The word of God, when you get the word into your system, it moves and it changes you and it multiplies. Anybody, praise God, who has an identity problem in the act of prov the, the act of pro proving we render ourselves ineffective in establishing our identity in God. In other words, when you try to prove to others, amen, uh, what you can do and what you cannot do, amen, and you try to prove or you do it, uh, we, 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 we render ourselves ineffective in establishing our identity in God. Because at the truth of the day, nothing that we do in the kingdom of God should be of ourselves. What we do, we do it in the spirit. We do it as unto God. Amen. And therefore, it's not for me to prove to you how much hermeneutics I know or how much apologetics I know. Mm -mm. Irrespective, you speak as thus saith the Lord. There are some times where God will tell you to talk for 10 minutes. Amen. And that's all that's needed to clear up the work. Another time, he might say talk for 15 minutes. But when we, when we have an identity problem, it's always to prove to others how much we know or what we know. But Jesus showed the devil that, look here, he did not have an identity problem. And we can learn from that particular scripture, praise God, clearly how God operates and how we should operate. Amen. If the devil tells you anything, no matter how good it sounds, Amen. If it's contradicting to the word of God, don't accept it. If it goes contrary to his word, shun it. The Bible says shun the very appearance of evil. In other words, it, 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 it look evil. Shun it. That's enough for you to say, this is not what I want. Amen. And when the devil comes with you, he's going to present like a gold coin. He puts the shiny part to you. But on the other side of the coin, it is black and ugly. Amen. But what he presents to you is the pretty side of the coin. Anything that comes from the devil is not good. The Bible says he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and he is the father of it. Amen. So we realize that many, 
Many people, even in Christendom, many child of God, have forgotten who they are and whose they are. They forget that, look here, at the end of the day, amen, your identity is really in Christ Jesus. And I said before, the enemy that's attacking our identity is the devil. And how the devil does, does that? He used a couple things in order to, to, to attack, a eh? so couple things to smear or to, to damage. Amen. Our identity. A couple things to, to make our identity not as clear as it should be. Amen. What he will use, for example, brethren, is our hurt and our pain. Now we're going to look at these. He looks, he, he will look at your past. He will say, Look here, look at you. This is how you used to be then. This is how you used to you used to go to the dance hall. You're not eloquent. Amen. You never went to high school or university. Look at you. Amen. This is what you used to do, or this is what you have done last week or last month. And the devil will use that because he wants to smear your identity. He will use societal views. He look the views of society. Amen. To, to, to help us to particle, to think a particular way about our identity. He will use our the social media. And we can touch that to show you the, how the devil uses this to frame us and to think in a particular way. Now let us jump into a couple of these. First of all, you know what I like about the Bible? In every situation. The Bible shows us examples of people, amen, who have gone through situations similar to what you have gone through, similar to what I have gone through, or I am going through, or I am about to go through, amen. But the Bible shows us that irrespective of what we are going through, there's an example in the word that is there to tell you that no devil can steal my identity, amen. So let us look at Joseph. For example, in the book of Genesis chapter 37, you, if, if you really want to study his life, you have to look on Genesis chapter 37 to Genesis chapter 50. Now, there are a couple of things I want you to realize about Joseph. First of all, he suffered mistreatment. He suffered abandonment. He suffered rejection. And this happened to him by persons who were supposed to show him love and protection. You see, at this particular time, amen, Joseph was the youngest son of Jacob. Amen. And therefore, if Joseph was the youngest son, it means that everybody else in his family, he looked up to them. They were the ones who were supposed to take care of him. Amen. He was the baby in the family. But yet still, being the baby, amen, he who was supposed to be having good treatment and having love. Amen. Here we find a gentleman who was mistreated. He was abandoned. He was rejected by persons who were supposed to show him love and protection. Many of us tonight can, can, can relate to this. Amen. He was disregarded and dismissed when he shared his dream. Imagine God gave him a dream. Amen. God told him about the moon and the stars and, 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 and the boy before him and so on and so forth. And he shared it out of excitement to his siblings and to his parents. And even his parents were, 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 were kind of drawn back. Are you saying that we are going to bow to you? He was disregarded and he was dismissed when he shared his dream. He was abandoned. I was literally sold out by his siblings. Can you imagine having gone through all of this bad treatment? I mean, they never liked him. Here comes the dreamer and his dream. Let us see what will happen to him and his dream now. And they abandoned him. The brethren, they took him, Joseph, and they threw him into a pit. And he was literally sold out by his siblings. No, you can't tell me. I don't know about you, but these things will affect you. It will cause a lot of hurt. It will cause a lot of pain. When you think about it, I mean, it's one thing when, when attacks come from outside. It's one thing when you, your friends uh, or people at work, I mean, do not like you or people at work try to treat you bad. It hurts. But it hurts even the more, amen, when it's your family, when it's people that should be your kingsman, people that should be your, the, the person who are your support, your, 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 your strength, people who you're supposed to go home and you can tell them what is happening. And these were the set of people that abandoned him and they literally sold him out, his siblings that is. Praise God. Not only that, we realize that George was even betrayed by his boss's wife. So it is that the man got to pain already. In, 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 in the pit. He was in the pit. He was sold into Egypt. And somebody bought him and the man's life. He was a slave. 
but his life seemed as if it went up a little bit. Amen. He was now in Potiphar's house and things seemed okay. Amen. Everything that was in the man's house was in his hands. Amen. He had control over everything. And in the midst of that, amen, having gone through all the things that were mentioned already, here it is that this woman come and she betrayed him by saying she wanted him to sleep with her. And she said, look here, Joseph said, look here, I cannot do this wicked thing and sin against my God. And she ran out. And we know the scripture well. Uh, she took his garment in her hands and she betrayed him. She communicated to her husband that the man tried to rape her. So the man was thrown in a pit. And now he is placed in a prison. My God, in a prison. God, what are you doing? What is happening to me? He must have said. Um, being in prison now, we thought that things would have gotten a little better. But, you know, so happy was there for a while and two persons he met, the baker and the butler. And we know what happened, they dream a dream. And Joseph was able to interpret the dream. And he even reminded, I think, the butler that, look here, when you come out, tell the Pharaoh about me. You know, remind him about me. I, I, I seem to be lost in the system. Praise God. And you would have thought... That having interpreted the dream for the man, the man would have remembered the man. But the man forget him altogether. Altogether. So he was left back in prison again and again for a good period of time. Look at, look at the adjectives that I just mentioned. And these, all of these adjectives speaks to hurt, speaks to pain. He was mistreated. He was abandoned. He was rejected. He was disregarded. He was dismissed. He was sold out. He was betrayed. And he was forgotten. All of these things happen to one person. And I cannot tell you something. The devil, if you don't know who you are in Christ, the devil will uh, mess you up. Because some of us, having had these experiences in our lives, some of us have gone through situations where we were mistreated and abandoned and we were reject rejected and we were dismissed and we were sold out. Amen. We knew that you were the best person in your department for do the job. Amen. But something happened and they, they overlook you. Amen. Are you wondering what you did? My God, what is happening? But I learned something about our identity. You see, when Joseph, uh, when your identity is in God, God will channel your hurt and your pain in the right place. Amen. God knows how to 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 take a situation god knows how to use your present situation irrespective of what the devil comes with god knows how to turn it around but it only happens to you when you when your identity is not in what happened on the external your identity is in god the uphill struggles could have stripped joseph of his God-given identity. But he couldn't do it. Because guess what? His identity was in God. And irrespective of what the devil came with. We realize that Joseph was able to come out victorious. So the Bible declared to us in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. And notice we said it starts from 37 to verse 50. We realize that uh, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. But as for you... Now here it is that 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 that, that the, the Joseph was here talking to his brethren. But tonight I want us to declare a word to the enemy. Amen. Declare a word to the devil. Irrespective of what he's going to ask for you, devil. You thought evil against me. But but I like that word, but but speaks to there's a contrast, there's a flip to it. God is going to do something magnificent. God meant it unto good. So the devil thought it was evil. The devil was working up his thing. The devil was doing his best thing to ensure that Joseph was lost based on his hurt and his and pain. But can I tell you something? When you have your identity set in God, when you have your identity sealed in God, amen, what the devil means for evil, God is going to show you that, look, I can turn this around for good. It says God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it's, is this day to save much people alive in other words all that joseph went through was for one purpose to save much people alive not only that because of what david went through he was able to preserve uh, uh, my god praise 
praise, praise. He was able to, to serve Judah. Amen. And through Judah, the, the, the seed line came. Through Judah, the Messiah came. So even though his brethren thought that they were doing evil against him, God, who is the master planner. Can I tell somebody something? When your identity is in God, when your identity is in him, no hurt and no pain that the devil will try to use is going to be, 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 be gone to naught. Amen. You know, there's a scripture in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1. It says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Amen. Now, go back. To number Israel. Praise God. So, what we realize, the scripture is saying that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. But the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 24 verse 1, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Praise God. Uh, and he moved David again, them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Now the question will be asked, who moved upon, uh, upon David? Was it the devil or was it the Lord? Amen. In Chronicles, it says it was the devil. In 2 Samuel, it says it was the Lord. But who it was? Can I tell you something? The devil was the one who wanted David to number Israel. But God used the situation because nothing that the devil comes with. I love the fact that God is the master chess player. Amen. When the devil thought that he's working out something, God used what the devil is working out for his glory at the end of the day. So it was really the devil who caused David to number Israel. But God himself, who is in charge of everything, moved upon and the devil and said, you need to go do that. Amen. Because he had an occasion against the Israelites who were doing evil in his sight at the time. Irrespective of what you're going through, you can trust God. Amen. That your hurt and your pain, the devil meant it for evil, but God is going to turn it around for good because guess what? Your identity is in God. The devil also uses your past. Amen. At different points in time, he will use your past to get to you. So the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 to 11, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Why? For the accuser, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Now, I want you to understand something about the scripture. First of all, the person who was making this loud cry, obviously, were people who were redeemed humanity. These were not angels. These were not uh, men, uh, 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 angelic beings. But this was humanity. These were people who were saved by Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And they spoke about what the devil would have done. They are saying they were happy. They were rejoicing. Amen. Because the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Can I tell you something? The devil is constantly reminding us of what took place in our lives years ago. The devil is constantly reminding you that look here, you will never be nothing good. You will never become to anything at all. He has a way of whispering words. He's a good planter of evil seeds amen and if you're not careful he will use your past to rob you I, I i heard a story quite recently and i want to to share that particular story in relation to your past in relation to to something so you can get an understanding of how the devil operates praise god i heard a story about a particular uh minister who practically wanted to understand how the devil uh, get people to do to commit suicide, how the devil get people to hurt themselves. And he realized what was happening. He said the devil, he got a vision and the devil appeared to him and said, look here, I'm going to cause this particular sister, amen, to, or this particular person to commit suicide. So the devil, the person was already sad and hurt. And the devil came to her and said, boy, he just whispered a word. And that's how the devil operates. You have to be careful which voice you listen to. A lot of our thoughts that we think originate from us, really sometimes it's not from us. Amen. Some of the thoughts that we think that, that come to your mind, they were 
you have to check back the word of God. Can you realize over time that it was the devil whispering a word, whispering something? Amen. So all the devil said to her, you know, she said nobody because she was already sad. She was hurt because she was somebody left her and she felt alone and she felt broken. Amen. She felt like this was it. Her life was done. Amen. And it so happened that the devil came to her and said, You know, she said nobody no love you. And she said, Yeah, nobody no love me, you know. Nobody no love me. I'm saying, you know, she said, everybody. And all the devil wants you to do at times so is to just respond to what he says. He wants to just repeat it. So when he plants that seed, he cannot say it one time. And because he has planted it and you start to become you start to begin begin to think that it is your thought. So the woman was there, she said, Yeah, man, nobody not like me. I'm saying she said, nobody else, you nobody not gonna want you. If they want you, this and this and this, and he keep on put and she said, last year you didn't do this, and that's why you know have no friend. I say, Yeah, me not have no friend. I say, if you kill yourself, if you kill yourself, you know, nobody not gonna miss you. And you're gonna really you're gonna get back to them. No, they're not gonna really pay attention to you. And she said, Yeah, man, I need to kill myself. And that's where the devil got her. I said, Yeah, man, remember say you have some poison run at the room. And she said, Boy, boy, we have some poison, you know. I'm going to do it. And the devil keep on a whisper, whisper. They say, nobody not like you. That's why the person left you. This is a, you are no good. You are, you are this and you are that. And he spoke to what was happening in our situation. Spoke to her past. Spoke to her. Tell her, she's no good. She's nothing. Praise God. It so happened that the woman uh, went around the kitchen and she took up the poison. And at that point in time, she was struggling now to drink the poison. I'm saying, man, drink it, man. Nobody now, nobody not like you, man. Drink it, man. Make them feel the pain. Make them go through the anger of, of, of knowing that they never treat you good. Drink it, man. And, and she did here, she struggled with drinking the thing. Can I tell you, a lot of times when the devil begins to whisper things, especially if you're a person who's a child of God and he begins to whisper, there is a struggle. There's a struggle over time because you know in your spirit, there's a fight in your spirit. But what I learned about God Holy Ghost what I learned about Jesus is that he does not trouble your decision but he will speak to your heart and he will say brethren this is wrong don't do this listen to my voice listen to me and the devil keep on saying to this woman kill yourself man do it man that them nobody not care about you man and see, that is why this happened to you and see, that's why they might talk about you all the time and she eventually drank the thing you now when she drank the thing he backed off that's the time she regretted it because she realized what she was doing. She wanted to stop it. But at that point in time, it was too late. And you know what the devil was doing? He was laughing. He was laughing and he was showing the man that he was showing the vision. This is how I get it. This is how I get people. And the person drank it and the person was trying to stop themselves. No, but it was too late. The poison was already in the system. And eventually they, they began to, to foam and so on and so forth until the person died. And as the person died, the soul came out and the devil lost take the soul. Amen. Because that was it for him. Can I tell you, brethren, don't allow the devil to whisper anything into your spirit. And I want you, if you're here tonight, to type out in the in the chat say your past does not define you hallelujah you are not defined by your past your identity is not dependent on something you have or do not have something you have done or have not done amen your identity is marked in christ jesus our lord our identity is in jesus christ say it again my i my past does not define me Type it. Say to somebody, my past does not define me. Amen. Who defines me is God. Amen. Can I tell you something, brethren? None of us, amen, not bar none, only Jesus Christ himself, every one of us can state in our lives that we have made mistakes in the past. Every one of us have gone to some laws that we, we regret. Every one of us, from the highest of us to the lowest of us, Amen. I've gone to places. But as I said before, I love the good old book because it defines some examples. And it's not like other religious books there that show men as characters who are infallible. Amen. The Bible shows the men in the Bible who, who we respect. Amen. People like Job and Peter and Marjan and, 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 and Paul and all these men. We respect these men. But guess what? Most of these men are examples of success after miserable failure. Look at Job, for example. Job lost every single thing. And the failure not, might not be a case where you do something wrong, you know. The failure might be there's something happening in your life. You are doing your best. And then out of the blues, COVID come, you lose your job. 
COVID come, you can't do this, you can't do that, what you used to do. Job lost everything that he owned in a particular day. My God. And that was enough. Uh, the devil says, skin for skin. Amen. Because he realized that he couldn't touch Job. Amen. Uh, the external things of Job, even though it hurt, it couldn't move him. So we realize what he did. He touched his body. Amen. When he touched his body, his body becomes sores, hurt. Guess what happened now? He got so bad that his very wife said that he was a loser. She called him a loser. And she suggests that he must curse God and die. Just curse God and just die. I think that was bad enough. Him brethren, him come round him and he sat and they look at him. Because you must, they, they did what I think was it's called retribution theology. Which practically believes that, look here, in order for you to be going through something like this, you must have done something wrong. So they sat down round him and they said, Job, no man, tell me, what you do? What you do? But we realize how God operates. Amen. I'm saying before, these men became successful in the end. Because your past does not define you. So guess what happened now? Job, the Bible says in Job 42, that he got double for his trouble. Peter denied the Lord three times. He was not perfect, but guess what? Peter was the one who preached the gospel, the first, this apostolic message that we love so much. This apostolic message that we hold uh, with very high esteem. Um, in the apostolic church, you go, you see Acts 2 30, it seems to be the theme of our hearts. Repent and be baptized. And Peter was the first one that was preached this message. Um, actually, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of the, uh, uh, and whatsoever he born on earth was born in heaven, and whatsoever he loose on earth will loose in heaven. And God gave him the keys to the kingdom. Peter, you know, the same person when him come to him and say, You didn't know Jesus? He said, No, me never know the man. Three times he denied him. Mark John was another example. Mark John went on the missionary journey and Mark John turned back at Perga. The, the, the road was too hard for him. Um, he, 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 he looked as if this was it for Mark John. As a matter of fact, when Paul was going on the second missionary journey, he decided that he would not have brought Mark John with him. Because guess what? The man turned back at Perga. But this is the same margin that Paul wrote about and said, send for him, for he's profitable to me and to the gospel. This was the same margin who wrote the book of John, um, a, a book of Mark. Even though most theologians would say it's the gospel of Peter, it doesn't matter. His name is ascribed to it, the gospel according to Mark. Because guess what happened? And guess what? You know the funny thing about it? It is even the first gospel that was written. So Mark. Matthew, Luke, and John was written after the fact. The first gospel that was written is the book of Mark. And who did that? The same man who turned back. I say it again. Your past does not define you. Amen. You are much more in God. You are a lot in God. Praise God. We look at the whole thing of uh, how the devil uses social media. Amen. To try to um, trick us up and get us to feel. Amen. That, 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 that. That, that, that he wants to switch our identity. The danger with this thing that is called social media, brethren, is that it is constantly bombarding you with images about a couple of things. It, 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 it is trying to define who you are supposed to be. It also dictates to us how you are supposed to look. It, look, it, 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 it adds where you are supposed to go. And how you are supposed to behave. It's a social media. And that's why I have to be very, very, very careful. Because I tell you, the devil, as I said before, is attacking our identity. He's attacking our Christian. That's why a lot of the young people are seem to be confused. Because at the end of the day, they are wondering, they're looking at social media. And they're looking at who is the who's. Not knowing that the who's out there are, 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 are having the same issues that they are having. It, it, it is trying to tell you how you are supposed to look. And therefore the Christian don't want to look like a Christian anymore. Because what he's feeling his mind on is saying that this is how you are supposed to look. It is telling you where you are supposed to go. If you are not at the high places, amen, you feel that you are nowhere. But guess what for your identity, it should not be defined by social media, by your past. It should not be defined by your hurt and your pain. Amen. Can I tell you something? Let me give you some quotes as it relates to social media and its danger. There's a guy called Sinan Aral. And he's the uh, professor of management at MIT. Um, he's a professor in IT and marketing. And here what he says. He says social media is designed for your brains. 
It interfaces with the parts of the human brain that regulate our sense of belonging and social approval. It rewards our dopamine system and encourages us to seek more rewards by connecting, engaging, and sharing online. In other words, what it does, it, 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 it gives you this instant rush like drugs. So when people, that is why when people go on social media, they are hooked on it. As a matter of fact, they call them, um, uh, I forgot the term, but there are particularly certain people that are designed to ensure that these uh, tools, you are hooked on it. And here it is that this guy is saying that it is designed for your brain. Can I tell you, brethren, you have to sometime wean yourself of these things because at the end of the day, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Amen. What am I saying is that you have to realize how the devil operates. You have to realize the attack of the enemy. And he's trying to use this medium to decide who you are. How you're supposed to look, where you're supposed to go, and how you're supposed to behave. But all of these things are already defined for you in scriptures. The Bible tell you who you're supposed to be. You're a child of God. The Bible tell you that you're a royal priesthood. The Bible tell you that you're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. The Bible tell you who you're supposed to be. Amen. There's another quote that I want to bring to you. And this from this lady. She's called uh, Germany Kent. And she's an American print and broadcast journalist she says look here there is a vital reason social media is linked to depression and loneliness in other words when you try to live up to the joneses and i can tell you some most of the things that we see on social media they're not even real they are pretend amen people put out a face Amen. And then you are trying to attain to something. Amen. And you feel that your life is not where it is supposed to be. Amen. But guess what? Guess what? She said there is a vital reason social media is linked to depression and loneliness. We live in a time when many people spend countless hours a day online strolling through the timeless of others with envy, in the terms, regret. And little appreciation for their own life. Sometimes you are trying to run after something that is looks glistering. But guess what? What you had all this time was gold. And you never realize it until time passed. To realize that all that you're running down, that you're seeing on social media, all that you're envying, all that the devil is presenting to you as you're trying to frame and break and make you into his identity. Amen. An identity that fits the world. You never realize that what you have in Christ was the golden thing. As a matter of fact, anything you have in Christ is the golden thing. Amen. So, look at the scripture. And this is something that the devil has been doing a long time. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, it says, again, the devil take it him up into an exceeding high mountain and show him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them so the devil went take you into a situation and he want to show you all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory there i'm saying all of this i will give you if you will fall down and worship me in other words there is a trade-off amen when we engulf ourselves in these things when we begin to see ourselves as we want to grasp all the kingdom of the world and the glory of there's a trade-off that is why you spend five hours on instagram and five hours on, on facebook book and so on and you only spend two minutes if at all in your scripture i you spend only two minutes if at all in prayer because there's a trade-off he is giving you the kingdom of this world and the glory for him to get back the worship because the moment you neglect worship of the almighty god you by default worship the enemy the enemy will take worship at any cost even if it's direct or indirect he doesn't matter as long as he can ask I get you not to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I mean, that is ultimate aim because he knows that our identity is wrapped up in Jesus. Amen. When we are in his presence, when we are in his word, amen, it frames our identity. It frames who we are supposed to be. So there is a crisis. There's a constant crisis. Amen. That is attacking the child of God. And as before, this constant attack comes through your heart and your pain. This constant attack comes to your past. This constant attack comes to society and social media. And it has caused us, uh, what we say, an identity crisis. And this is happening even in Christendom. But guess what? The identity crisis that we are seeing, uh, you're going to realize that it's kind of like twofold. It's twofold. One, some people understand their purpose in the kingdom. In other words, 
There are some people in the kingdom who have read the word of God. They read the Bible and, and they, they know enough. They have been around long enough. There are people who grew up in the house of God and they, they, they grew up and they hear sermons and they hear this and they know it. But what they lack is an encounter with God. So therefore, while they know what they are supposed to do, they do not know how to apply it properly. Amen. And therefore, what is needed is an encounter with the Almighty God. Okay, look at the example with Moses. And there are some other people who have another type of identity crisis. One, these are the people, they do not know the Word of God. Because they, and therefore, because they do not know the word of God, they lack an understanding about what God is saying about them. Amen. So they live any and any way, even though they come to church. They don't spend enough time in the book to know what God is saying. Amen. So they define beauty, for example, as an outside thing. When God is saying, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that prays the Lord, she shall be praised. In other words, Fear of the Lord is true beauty. I mean, not how you look on the outside. Praise God. They, they, they don't realize that irrespective of what the world is dictating, I mean, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what Christ is saying about you. But some people, because they are not in the good book, they lack these things. So we're saying the identity crisis is twofold. People who understand what the Bible is saying, who have been around long enough to know what the scripture is saying, but they do not know how to apply it. And we're going to look at that. And you have some people who, who don't know what the word of God says. Amen. And therefore, they really don't know what God is saying about them. And this affects our identity in him. So, we walk into our identity when we do two things. When we know the word... And it is coupled with an encounter with God. In other words, when you know the word of God and you have a relationship with God, amen, it frames your identity. It frames who you're supposed to be. And number two, we walk into our true identity when we allow the word of God to transform our minds and we allow the creator to tell us who we are. So in other words, the word of God transform our minds amen and then through the word of god uh we allow god himself the god of heaven the word which became flesh amen to tell us who we are now let us look at for example the example with moses amen uh as we build our first point the first point we're saying is that some people understand their purpose in the kingdom but they do not how how to apply it now let's look at the example i said with moses Exodus chapter 2 from verse 11 to 12 says this. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their, on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked his way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sun. Now, like Christians today, Amen. What you're going to realize is that Moses, like Christians today, who is in the world, but they are not of the world. Amen. We realize that Moses was a Hebrew. Amen. Who was brought up in an Egyptian world. So he was a Hebrew, but his world was Egypt. Amen. Uh, we know the story well of him, that he was, was rescued by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And even prior to that, in Exodus chapter 1, uh, and going into chapter 2... We realize that uh, they, 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 because the Israelites were, were practically growing in number, amen, there arose a fear of many years after, amen, who did not know uh, Joseph. Um, and and he, he brought a lot of burden on the people, amen. And when he saw them start to grow and the numbers start to become strong, he decided that he was going to kill every boy child below a certain age. And the Bible said that, that, that Moses' mother looked at him and realized that he was a goodly child. Amen. And she hid him for three months. But you can only hide somebody for so long. Amen. It so happened after she had him for three months, she decided, that God, I'm going to put him into your hands. And she put him in a, in, a, in, a, in a basket, as it were. And she led him down the river. Amen. And she put him in the hands of God. And we know what happened. Uh, he was rescued from the river by Pharaoh's daughter and raised by his Hebrew mother. 
father. What an interesting thing. Because when he when 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 the Pharaoh's uh, daughter took him, amen. It so happened that Miriam realized what was happening, and they realized that they wanted somebody to take care of the child because that's what they do. They use the slaves, amen, as persons to help them to take care of their children. And it so happened that Miriam went back to her mother Jochebed, and she was able to come back, amen, and offer the services to Pharaoh's daughter to take care of Pharaoh's daughter's child which really was her child so what was happening he was now growing up in Pharaoh's house and he was taken care of by his own mother amen and he was given a place of honor in the part in Pharaoh's palace what a powerful thing so here it is that he's growing up in Pharaoh's house but I strongly believe that his mother was teaching him the ways of the Hebrews, was teaching him about the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Amen. She was teaching him about the story about Joseph going down into Egypt and preserving. She was teaching him the ways. And that's why I said earlier uh, in the previous lesson, it's important that we pass on our heritage from one generation to the other. She was passed. And even though he was growing up in Pharaoh's house, I strongly believe that there was a word that was being injected in his spirit. As before, there are people in the house of God who know the word of God there's a word that has been injected in his spirit and he knew what to do from the life of Moses we see that God positioned him perfectly to relieve the persecution and affliction of his people uh, he was placed now in a position of in 40 years amen in Egypt he was now in a position to now do what he's supposed to do but guess what there is a problem when you try to do things your way so how did Moses go about trying to do to 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 do that uh, we realize that he saw and the scripture that we read earlier is in reference in the book of Hebrew is in reference to uh, how he operated so what happened he saw an Egyptian hitting his brethren. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrew 11, 24 uh, to 25, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So what did the man do? The man actually killed the Egyptian. He did it the wrong way, you know. He killed the Egyptian and he brought deliverance to the Israelites. But, but that's not how God intended for it to be done. So if though he was trying to do the right thing, he was doing the wrong thing. So he was trying to do the right thing because he never had really an encounter with God. It's how to operate. Amen. He realized that he was doing the wrong thing. So what did God do to him? Because God wanted him to operate. Not only from a knowledge that what he's supposed to do is calling, but also a knowledge of how God wants him to move. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So what did God with, with Moses? God took him into the wilderness to teach him. In other words, the man having no uh, run away, the Pharaoh was seeking to kill him and he had to run to the wilderness. There's something about the wilderness experience, brethren, hallelujah, that we need to realize that God sometimes, even though in our heart of hearts, we want to do the right thing, but we are doing it the wrong way. Amen. We want to, to, to get some things done and we think that we know the word of God and we know God's plan for our life. But sometimes, God, we need what we really need to bring that out is a good encounter with God. So God took him from his second and furious uh, palace and so on and brought him down into the wilderness to teach him. So in a little while, he learned about he was a shepherd. Amen. He was tending to sheep for a while. And it was in the wilderness that he had an encounter with the burning bush. In other words, he had an encounter with the great I am. And when he had that encounter, he realized at this point in time that God was not ready to use him. Can I tell you some, somebody something? God is getting ready to use you. But what is going to happen is that you're going to have a wilderness experience. You have the word, but God is bringing you in the wilderness to teach you. And when he teaches you, he will send you back to fulfill that purpose. At the first time when he did it on his own, he was only able to deliver one Egyptian, one Israelite. But when God sent him back after he had an encounter and he had the word coupled together 
he was able to deliver two million people out of bondage. What am I saying? Brethren, God is a good God. Amen. When we have an encounter with God, amen, when we have an encounter with God coupled with the word of God, it reveals our true identity. It puts us where God would have us to be. Have the word and have the encounter because when you have an encounter with God, you begin to see the way God wants you to see yourself. You begin to operate the way God wants you to operate. And that's how God works. We see a lot another example. We're talking about the same thing with Joseph or with Jacob, sorry. He had a similar experience in life like, 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 like Moses. And we find this story in chapter 27 where Jacob was sent out to deceive his father Isaac. Uh, he, was, he was so desperate about getting the blessing uh, 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 that, that, that was intended for his brother Esau that he would have gone to any great length to ensure that he get that blessing. Um, some of us Amen. Uh, we know we have good intention, but sometimes we have to make sure that when we get the blessing, we get the blessing the right way. Amen. So when Jacob went to his father's chamber and, and his father asked him, who was there? Who are you? This is where the identity crisis came into being. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Thus, we see Jacob claiming to be Esau. Now, that is what happened. A lot of people come to the house of God and we know you want a blessing. We know you want the things of God, but you're not moving in the person that God wanted. You see, you can't get the blessing in somebody else's name. Amen. You can't pretend to preach like T.D. Jakes. Amen. When God didn't give you that type of thing. You can't, you can't, you can't try to get a blessing uh, that really doesn't belong to you. He was actually saying he is Esau. All right. We know what happened. He got a blessing, yes? And sometimes when you do some stuff because you're, you're a misfit of your identity, you will get a blessing, but it will cause your pain. It will cause your problems. When you try to operate in somebody else's anointing, when you try to behave like somebody else, amen, and not operate how God called you to be, it can be a problem. You first have to realize who you are so that God can transform you. So he wanted a blessing. When the man asked him, who are you? He said, I am Isa. He got the blessing. But we know what happened. For 20 years, the man had to run away. My God, for 20 years, he was, he was out there. But we know what happened. Eventually, you have to come to yourself. Because you can operate for a long time as somebody else. But in order for you to get the true blessing that is intended for you, amen, you must come to an understanding of who you are. So in chapter 32, verse 22 to 32, uh, we see uh, Jacob now coming back. Amen. He was about to meet upon his brother. And he was fearful. He had to send his family ahead of him. Amen. He, he, we know what happened with the story. He went to his uncle and we know Lehman and all of the things that happened to him. But as I said before, he had to come back to himself. And look what happened now. When he came back to himself, we see Jacob here again, this time seeking a blessing. And again, the same question was asked of him. What is your name? What a powerful thing. It's the first time he got the blessing trying to be somebody else. The second time he got the blessing. But guess what? This time. And can I tell you something? He was struggling to the point where the angel touched him in the hollow of his thigh. And I told you last week, limp, a limp walk with God, as a preacher said, it's not a limp walk with God. The preacher also said, I'm limping, but I'm not lame. I never forget these messages as a young man. So the preacher, so, so, so the angel asked him, what is your name? And he responded, I am Jacob. It's at that point in time now. God, the blessing now was no longer from uh, his father. The blessing come directly from God. God blessed him. In other words, you have to come to an understanding of who you are. This is me. I not will try to pretend to be somebody else. I know that I, I, I have my flaws, I have my faults, I have my issues. I have I've gone through this, I've gone through that. Amen. But at the end of the day, this is who I am. Amen. God, this is who I am and I want a blessing from you. God, I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes. And when you have come to that understanding and come to that, then God will put you into your rightful identity. He was Jacob. 
He was a trickster. He was a supplanter. And God said, what is your name? He no longer him couldn't hold it out no longer. He wrestled till the morning. He was wrestling with God. Till eventually he said, I am Jacob. And when he realized that he was Jacob, or he said that he was Jacob, that was the point in time that God blessed him and changed his name to Israel, which means a prince with God. Is there anybody who wants to be a prince with God? Come to an acknowledgement of who you are. So the question then, when we look at these two examples, the question then is, who are you? What is your name? Amen. I'm going to say before, you can't allow your past to define you. You can't allow uh, your hurt and your pain to decide your identity. You can't allow the society and social media to frame you into your, into your mold. Because the truth is that who really are you when you become a child of God? Who are you? You need to know who you are in Christ so that you can live a life as God intended it to be. So that you can fulfill your identity in him. You can fulfill your destiny. Amen. You see, the more you agree with God about your identity in Christ, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your God-given identity. In other words, the more you begin to realize who you are, who God has called you to be, amen, the more you start to, to, to go into the word of God, the more you start getting an encounter with the king of kings, is the more God is going to, is going to begin to reflect your God given your identity. Your God given identity is not decided, amen, by anybody else. Your God given identity is not decided by the person. Your God given identity is decided by God Himself. I know how I know that. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 11. But now, thus say the Lord that created thee, and He that formed thee. He says, O Israel. Fear not. That's the first angle. The devil wants to initiate fear in our lives because he knows fear cripples us. He knows fear will move us into a realm where, we're, where, we're, where we can't operate uh, as we should. So God first thing to you is that, look here, when I saved you, brethren, I know you used to be a junkard, I know you used to be a liar, I know you used to be a backbiter, I know you used to be a prostitute, and I know all of these things, but when God has called you and God has created you and formed you the first thing he's going to say to you when he saves and he gives the Holy Ghost amen fear not he said that like perfect love casts it out all fear and guess what when you got the Holy Ghost the love of God he should have brought in your heart by the Holy Ghost so he said fear not and he tell you why he said for I have redeemed thee number one he said I have called thee by thy name number two and he said thou art mine so there are three things that God says about us. God says, I have redeemed you. So who are you? You are redeemed by God. He says, I have called you by your name. In other words, he never called you by a number. Amen. He makes sure that he's been talking to you. Whoever you are. Stacy. Or Michael. Or, or, or Gary. Amen. He has called you by your name. And him couple it together and say, you are mine. That's what God is saying. That is your identity. You are God's. So God says, I have redeemed thee. You see, the Redeemer bought an unfortunate relative out of their slavery and debt. When God says, calls himself our Redeemer, what it practically does, it looks forward to the price that was paid for our salvation. Can I tell you something? Uh, the devil will tell you that you are worthless. The devil will try to put in your mind that you value nothing. If I ask you how much I would pay for this particular phone, amen, you might say, okay, $20. Somebody might say $500. But the true value of the phone is how much you are willing to pay for the phone. Amen. So even though I have the phone, if somebody have this phone and say they want to pay $5 million for it for whatever reason, amen, at the end of the day, Five million dollars is what this phone values. But guess what? To show that you are special to God. Amen. The Bible said he came down and he redeemed you. And how he redeemed you? He purchased you with his own blood. You are so much valuable to him. Amen. That he was willing to come and carry his cross. He was willing to, 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 he loved you so much. You are so valuable to him. Amen. That he was willing to pay the ultimate price. For you, it means that you value Allah. No wonder heaven rejoices when one soul repents. 
Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Because guess what? God has redeemed you. I never say an angel redeemed you. I never say a man redeemed you. I'm saying the person who is the ultimate of the universe. I'm saying the person who, who says let there be and there was. I'm saying the person who holds everything in its place. Decided that he was going to put on flesh. And he was going to come and he was going to walk the streets of earth. And he was going to go on Calvary's cross to die. That's how much you value. Who am I? I am valuable in God. And guess what? God bought me twice. He redeemed us by creation. So he owns me by creation. Because he is the one that formed me. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. But not only that. He owns you because he redeemed you. He bought you back. Reminds me of the story of Goma who sold herself and went into prostitution. Amen. And the man was willing to go and buy her back in a similar way. All of us are Gomas. Because all of us were sheep without a shepherd. We were going wayward. We were out of it. Amen. That is why we can't look down on anybody at the end of the day. Because Christ was the one who bought us back. He has ownership for us through creation and through redemption. He says, I have redeemed me. That's who you are. He says, I have called thee by my name. You are mine. His ownership is personal. Because he says, I have called you by your name. In other words, in, 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 in nowadays, they give people numbers. You, you, you know, a lot of time, they talk about your ID number, or your theory number, your social security number, or whatever. God not deal with that. God call you by your name. Each and every one of us. The Bible tell, tell the book of Matthew how special you are. Him telling look here, if God can take care of the lilies of the field and all of these things, you are special to him. And that is why, what is what the devil wants to, to, to get us to, to not realize our identity. Because when you realize how valuable you are, you won't sing to any law. Amen. You can say, boy, God, God, God loves me. And therefore, God owes me. I'm a person of value. He calls me by my name. And not only that, he not only, he not only call you by name, he seal it. He not call you by name, he, he, he seal the agreement, he say, you are mine, my God. You know, you go some places that you feel like, say, uh, nobody to call your own, or nobody, to, you go some places that you feel like you don't fit in. I, I remember growing up, and I, I, I personally remember in high school, I, I, I stood out, not even high school, primary school, I stood out, I, I, I felt a little weird, amen. I never had a lot of friends, even in primary school, even in high school, amen. Uh, thank God for the, the few I had, praise God. And, 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 and sometimes I felt out of it, I felt out of place. But when you read scriptures like this, you realize that, how can you feel like this? Brethren, if nobody else not love you, there is somebody who loves you and nobody else's love can't top it. As a matter of fact, God's love amen, can't be no more and it can't be no less. It is so high, it is so deep, it is so wide, it will blow your mind. God loves you. My God, God loves you. When we know who we are in Christ, it does some things for us. It changes the way we live. It makes us live because we know that we are in Christ. We are in Christ. It, it, it causes us to rise above our adversity. Amen. There, there, there are some situations that will come in our lives that will want us to make us feel down and out. But when, you're, when you know who you are in Christ, when you realize that this, everything in this world is just temporal. But guess what? You have Jesus Christ who is eternal. You have Jesus Christ who you will reign with him forever. It allows you in the back of your mind to say, boy, you know, uh, it, it was, when, I, when I think about Paul, for example, Paul is a perfect example of, of, of this to show you how, how he can rise above everything that exists, even if it's good or bad. When Paul described his credential to the Philippians, it blew your mind. He, tell you he was of the stock of this, and he was trained of this, and he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, and so on and so on, and he was blameless according to the law. And, and when a man gives his credentials, at the end of the day, he said, my God, who is me? It's a hole on your face. But Paul looked at it and Paul said, all of them things that I have is 
dung. It's nothing. It is worthless. You know why? Because he knew who his real identity is. It was supposed to be in Christ. He said, I'm going to call all these things nothing that he might gain the true identity that he's supposed to be. We lost it in the brethren. Where you think Adam was able to, to number all the animals, name all the animals? Where you think Adam was able to, 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 to assist with doing certain things? And he did it mighty because he had his identity in the image of God. That's what Jesus came back to remind us of. That's why he's called the second Adam. That's who you are. Amen. That's what Christ come to show you. That you can live above your adversity. You can live above your situation. Because us to not live above our rights and privileges. When we, when we don't know who we are in Christ. It will live below our rights. We live below our privileges. We live like say. Uh, we live like say we are just an ordinary common person. Mm -mm. You're not a commoner. You're a prince with God. Amen. You're a royal priesthood. Royalty in your blood. Ah, his royal blood flow through your vein. My God. And that's why we need to understand. The devil wants us to, to, to act like everybody else and talk like everybody else and live like everybody else. No, brethren. When you know who you are in Christ, when you have your identity in Christ, you live how you're supposed to live. Praise God. So the Bible has declared some powerful things about who we are. Some powerful things about who you are. I want to remind us tonight about a few of them. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. Ha kobasa. In other words, you are the salt of the earth. A lot of us read the scripture and don't even realize what it means. We think from the perspective of the fact that salt causes uh, flavor in pot and whatever. But in those days, salt was valuable. Soldiers, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. And God is saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the value of the earth. He wants to say, you are the light of the world. In, in other words, in, you can't have a light. And it don't stand out. As a matter of fact, the darker this world gets, the brighter the light seems to shine. That is how it's supposed to be. That's what God is saying of you. You are the light of the world. God is saying that you are an ambassador for me. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, hallelujah, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. In other words, all the things that for your past gone. Don't let the devil tell you, say, boy, uh, you, 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 you used to do this, and you never get that, or whatever, or you grew up, or your mother abused you, and you were sexually assaulted, and, when, and all things are passed away. When you become in Christ, all things are become new. Hallelujah. And all things are God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. So here it is, the scripture is telling us, what the ambassador is supposed to do. He is given a ministry of reconciliation. And it started this way. It said to wit that God was in Christ. And that is why our identity have to be in Christ. Because to wit that God was in Christ. Reconciling or bringing back the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And then committed unto us now. The word of reconciliation. That's why I can say to somebody, look at you are above what the devil is saying. You are not a you're not a worthless person. You're not a, a, a scumbag. You're not a terrible person. You're not you're not you're not you're not the scum of the earth. No, 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 no. We are no ambassadors in Christ. And therefore, it is our duty as ambassadors, amen, to reconcile people back to God. Sometimes you have to reconcile the unsaved. Sometimes the saved people too, you have to give them a word of encouragement in a time that they need it the most. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. So here Paul is telling the Corinthian church who they are. They are ambassadors for Christ. Let me move into a little bit into that. Who is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative sent by one kingdom to represent our chance of business in another. In other words, uh, all of us here as Christians, when you become a child of God, and the Bible says you're an ambassador, this world is not your home. Amen. This is not your country. And therefore, anything that you say represents the kingdom. Anything that you cut out your mouth represents the king. That is why as children of God... We have to be careful how we speak. But not only that, anything you wear 
represents the kingdom. So you have to be careful how you dress. Anywhere you move represents the kingdom. Because you have to be careful how you move and where you go. And that's why people always say to him, I just say you're a Christian and you do that. Because they know how the king is supposed to operate. And guess what? You are an ambassador of the king. And therefore, as an ambassador, you represent him on earth. The ambassador is a messenger, an authorized agent of the kingdom of the country he represents. You represent heaven, brethren. I know these things blow the angel's mind. They look into these things because they can't understand. You as clear, you as you as 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 as, as mud ball. Bishop uh, Stanford Griswold said we are glorified mud balls. Amen. Practically, we are nothing, but God is saying that you are an ambassador, an authorized agent. That sounds big. You're big man. And guess what our assignment is? Our assignment as ambassadors of the kingdom is a lifetime commitment. It's the moment you get saved. Amen. It, as long as you're alive, God send you, you're here, you get saved. You know your purpose is life forever. You can't be an ambassador tomorrow and not an ambassador the next day. And I can dig out this or exegete this or go more into what this is about in terms of the ambassador. But because of the sake of time, we're going to show you some things. Once you have accepted this commission, you can't look back. And you have to be careful what you do because the world is looking on. That is why we don't do any or anything. We don't behave any or any way. And we, we, we try our actions. Our actions should be measured by the book. Sometimes we measure our actions by how we feel. Sometimes we do our actions by what we think. But our actions should be measured by the book. Because guess what? While we are ambassadors, God gave us a manual to work with. And this manual tells us how to dress and how to look and who we are. We are his. We are in Christ Jesus. And we said before, you cannot look back. Luke 6, 92 says, And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Brethren, it's not time to look back. I want us to understand something, brethren. I want us to understand something, brethren. In Christ, there's a lot of things that we can talk about in Christ. You don't have to worry. People don't love you. You are loved in Christ. 1 John 3, 3 tells you you are loved in Christ. You feel like you don't fit in? Praise God. You are a part, you are a member of Christ's body. Amen. And that scripture, amen, is found in the fact that we are a member of the body of Christ. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. We are so fitted together, Bible says we are lively stones. My God. There are so much things. The Bible said you're a saint. The Bible said you're a child of God. It means that your father, your papa, Abba Father, the person who look after you, the person who will ensure you, it's taking care of you, is God Almighty, you're a child of the King. My prayer for us is that we begin to look into our true identity of who we are in Christ. You know, there's a term that is used a lot of times, the apostles used it uh, in their writings. Every time they talk about it, the word Christian is hardly used in scripture. It really know what is used in scripture is that we are in Christ. Bible says we are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Everything is talking about us being in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Why in Christ? Because in Christ is what defines our identity. When the devil comes to you and tells you, say you're ugly, no, 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 you're not ugly, man. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you fear God, that is beauty. That is beauty in the eyes of God. If you're beautiful in the eyes of God, my God. It gives me confidence. We know that God says, I am this. The devil tried to frame and put and mold things. And beauty is what exists out there. No, true beauty is in the house of God. True beauty is people who are meek and humble and love each other. True beauty is when we can, we can operate in a, in, in, a, in a fear of love and in fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You want wisdom? Begin to love God. Tonight, I pray God that somebody was blessed. Somebody was, was blessed by understanding that, look here, you're not a failure. You might have had done some things in the past, but your past does not define you. I want us to understand that you might have hurt. 
You might have troubles, but you're not the only one that have gone through that. We see people in scripture, but God has a purpose for your pain. You see, when uh, one preacher put it this way, there's power in pain. You see, when Jesus was on the cross and they pierced his side, yes, outflow blood and water, but what came out of him, what the devil didn't realize, it was releasing salvation. He was releasing the blood and the water that got me and you safe. The blood that flows from Calvary. There's power in it, man. And guess what? At the end of the day, God will get the glory out of everything. Let us continue to trust God and let us ask God to help us to walk in our true identity in a season where the devil wants to break our identity, where the devil wants to change us, wants us to, to be conformed to this world. The Bible says in Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God says, and be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How we renew our mind by the word. That we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the perfect will of God? When we begin to walk in our identity. Walk in who God has called us to be. Walk in the true calling of God. You have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen. That you might in this time. In a time where people don't know who they are, people are confused about if they are sex and their gender, people don't know if they are male or female, you're calling the kingdom at a time as this to show this world true light, to show this world that you are the salt of the earth, to show this world that you are an ambassador to somebody that somebody loves you and you are not defined by this world, but Jesus defines who you are. Amen. Bow your heads tonight as we pray. Great God, we exalt you tonight. We magnify your name one more time. Hi, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, amen, are the source of our strength and you are the strength of our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that it is in you we live and move and have our being. We thank you tonight, Jesus, that your presence is here with us and your presence is heaven to us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that I am not defined, hallelujah, by what the enemy says. I'm not defined by my past. I'm not defined by my hurt. I'm not defined by what I'm going through, by my circumstances. But my definition is in you. Hallelujah, Jesus. You said you have called me by my name and I'm yours. You said you have redeemed me. And you said I must not fear, hallelujah, because you are with me. Hallelujah. I pray, God, that you'll continue, Lord, to mold me into the person who you'd have me to be. Put me on the potter's wheel. Hallelujah. Continue, Lord Jesus, to shine me down and to the point where I can see, you can see yourself in me. Continue, Lord Jesus, to put me, hallelujah, on the wheel and continue to minister in my life and to the point that where I'm shaped like you, where I talk like you, where I walk like you. God, hallelujah, like you did with Moses, you brought him into the wilderness. Hallelujah. That you might teach him. God, some of us have been going through a wilderness experience but we realize that men of God have gone through their wilderness experience also Moses and Jesus and Paul and John these people have entered the wilderness but they came out in the power of the spirit God do your work in our lives hallelujah and form us in our true identity I pray and God for every person who is hearing the word right now help us Lord Jesus not to be hearers of the word help us Lord Jesus to live a life that's pleasing to you live a life that's acceptable to you live a life we want to be like you let all our credentials that we have, all the things that we think that is high and mighty, all that, everything that, that, that is not, uh, hallelujah, we want to form God's in our life. Let them come down and let God be glorified. You exalted, you be lifted up high in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, for this study that we have done tonight. And I pray, oh God, that somebody will leave feeling blessed. Somebody will realize that their hurt doesn't define them. Somebody will realize that you're not defined by your past. Somebody will realize that, hallelujah, social media, hallelujah, can't dictate. What you see there, hallelujah, is not a true reflection of where God wants us to be. But help us, Lord, just to look into the true mirror, the true mirror, which is the word of God. Where we touch shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God. Cover us under your blood, Holy Father, as we look to you, who is the author, who is the finisher of our faith. Thank you one more time for what you have done tonight. Continue to bless us. Continue to bless Bishop Daly and to bless Faith Apostolic Ministry. Bless all the ministers. Bless all the saints. Hallelujah. And help us, Lord Jesus, to walk in the fear and the knowledge of God. To grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We honor you tonight and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
God richly bless you. God richly bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember, you're not defined by your hurt. You're not defined by your past. You're not an eagle. Better yet, you're not a chicken. You are an eagle. A lame walk with God is a lame, not a lame walk with God. If God has to touch you sometime, ensure that at the end of the day, amen, God is doing a mighty work in your life. Praise God. Um, come this Sunday, amen, we know group one and two were supposed to come Sunday, God, because we had the, the threat, amen, of Hurricane Elsa, which is another blessing that has come our way, amen. And we need to give God thanks. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, that in everything we must give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. So we thank you, God, for preserving us one more time. And this Sunday we're asking group one and two, amen, to come out for service. So the nine o'clock service will be for group one, uh, starts at nine o'clock. And the, 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 the 11 o'clock service will be for group two. Come with an expectation. Come with something on your heart. Come with the fact that you are looking for God to continue to mold you into the person who you are to be. Amen. As we look to him one more time. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your night. Go with God. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Amen.